So hello everybody. I'm Tristan. I work for CodeThink, and I'm here to talk to you about I'm here to talk to you about BuildStream, which is a new build and integration technology useful for integrating full software stacks and for developing software within these stacks. Um, at CodeThink, we've had some previous iterations of build tooling uh, called BaseRock and YBD, and this is basically an extension or a new version that we're using to build in GNOME and Flatpak and et cetera, et cetera. So let me get started because I'm a little bit late and flabbergasted. And the slides will help me get on top of my game. <laughs> so what is BuildStream? A uh, trustable build and integration tool we, because we have a focus on deterministic builds and we isolate our build sandboxes. So basically, every build environment is like a production build environment, whether you're you know, on a build server or on your laptop. Every build environment is the same. Um, basically, it's a pipeline of file system data permutation. So the design is very simple. I, I don't have a thing here. so. The design is very simple. It's just basically a pipeline of elements related by their dependencies, and each element performs uh, some activity on its input file system data and creates output file system data and so on. It just happens to be useful for builds. Sandboxed execution environment. Um, builds don't have access to the network, et cetera, et cetera as you would expect in a production build environment. Um, we do caching and sharing of build artifacts, which is interesting for work groups uh, and, for, and for CI and for a combination of both. For instance, a work group might use a CI server who's doing production builds or just test builds a lot, and that means that since they're populating an artifact cache, when a user or a developer builds, then most of what they want to build is already available and they can just download it instead of building. Um, Multi-purpose build instructions and metadata. So perhaps you've been in this position where you have an application and you want to distribute it on several targets. Say you want to distribute a flat pack, you want to distribute, um, well, Bad example because we don't really support Windows yet, but you know you want to support a, a Windows bundle or a, you know or a Debian package, and you have to have this build directory with so many different scripts of uh, all the different ways that you build your software, and we want to be able to allow you to do everything with the same build metadata. So there's that, and it has a developer story. We'll get into that later, right? So what are our motivations for developing BuildStream? Um, so looking at this in, as a perspective of, you know, we weren't satisfied with BuildRoot. We weren't satisfied with Yocto. And we, we're coming from a perspective where we want to build custom Linux firmwares for embedded systems, right? So. One of the things that we observe is um, a lot of work is duplicated in, in cross-compilation in different projects such as BuildRoot and Yocto and pushing patches upstream to high-level or middleware which doesn't really need to work with cross-compilation. So I wonder if it's even worthwhile to spend all of that human energy patching upstream stuff, patching middleware to be able to cross-compile and patching their configure scripts and their build, their build files um, seems like a big waste when all we really need to cross-compile is a base runtime and a kernel. And from there, we can basically just native compile or virtualize and, and save ourselves the whole, the whole headache. But 
at the same time, BuildStream doesn't really prevent you to do cross compilation. This is just kind of my, you know, opinion. Um, one of the motivations is smoke testing builds on new host platforms. We don't want to have to do that, right? So we just say that we're never going to touch the host platform. So why bother smoke testing your whole build on a new version of Ubuntu or a new version of Debian or a new version of Fedora where everything just work the same, right? Um, it's in a later slide, but basically we have a no host tool policy in BuildStream. You can never build on your host. You build on your host, but you never use your host compiler, you never use your host libraries, everything's always containerized, right? Um, and another point is complicated setups for production builds. So since build systems generally are a byproduct of a distribution, right? Um, the build system is just basically, a, well, we needed to also build this. So these things are like, you know, RPM and Debian, they're more than 30 years old now and they come from a time where we had a very different set of needs so people still get to do production environment build build setups but then they use OBS and you have to like set up a server and everything and you have to you know integrate three or four technologies together just to get something that is more or less repeatable and reproducible as a build environment and that was one of our motivations. Um, monolithic repositories of metadata. So if, if anybody, has anybody in the audience used BuildRoot or Yocto? Oh, that's, that's not very many people, okay. Well, generally, when you're in these systems, they're the more popular systems for generating custom Linux firmware. So if you, if you want to, any device, if you want to make a modem or <laughs> not a modem, but you know, if you want to make a set-top box or, or anything basically based on Linux, you're going to use one of these tools to target your platform and to target your hardware and to build something customized and to take Linux, libc, the compiler and you know, all of the core utils and everything you're going to build it in this one system, right? And BuildStream is kind of another one of these, except you can use it for other stuff, right? And this is the build space that we're working with. Um, typically, these repositories or these systems come with a prepackaged set of instructions to build this system. So they already have a knowledge of what they're going to build, which is another thing we don't really like. But they're also monolithic repositories, which means that you have one repository with all the build instructions to build basically everything that you could possibly build, right? And that means that, say, if you have a, you have like a system or, or a, a base image where you might want to use Qt, right? And Qt5 and uh, Wayland, right? Then you're going to have that all in the same tree with the Linux kernel and with, uh, with glibc. And then when you make a modification to glibc or, or to how you build glibc or how you build the kernel, and it's going to have a repercussion on all the different variations of things that you can build, right? So this kind of creates friction in a huge environment like Yocto where you have like so many different output platforms. And uh, yeah. So note on the time. Um, so basically, the, the fact that we had all of this in the same tree was something that we didn't like. So we wanted something that was more flexible, which allowed upstreams to cons downstreams to consume from upstreams. So upstreams would be lower level, lower level stacks, and people would maintain those, and upstreams could consume them. And then 
if we were developing a desktop environment, then we could just decide when to depend on a new version of a, of a runtime. So I'm going to skip over this because it's basically the same thing. Tight coupling of build systems and distributions means that you know, we have this build system, but it's only made to build this, and I can't use it to build that, basically, because it's ingrained and it's built together, and it's not flexible. Um, so what are developers? <laughs> what about the developers? You know, um, Generally, developers work on their laptop, work on a, on a module, test it on their own, and push the stuff upstream and say, OK, it's fixed. Or if you're in, like a, in a company, then you might have higher bar of entry and a, a lot more restraints. But you're making the developer's life difficult by saying that you have to install this device, and you have to deploy to this device. And we want to bring that introduction that integrated production environment directly to the developer's workstation so that the developer can actually test within a target product in, within a targeted environment. And we do the best that we can within a container shell, but uh, you know, of course, at a certain point you have to boot a VM or boot on hardware. So I'm going to skip over this because it's not important. Um, cross compilation. So I basically spoke about this already. Production builds everywhere by default. Let's just take the environment, bring it to the developer's laptop. Um, so we have a high focus on reproducible, reproducibility and repeatability. Repeatability of the same process is to say that we can confidently repeat exactly the same process every time that we build something. Um, reproducibility these days means bit for bit reproducibility of the output. So for a given set of inputs, we know that the output will always be bit for bit identical. That is not something that we can achieve. Because if you look at the reproducible builds um, project, which is actually very interesting, um, there's a bunch of reasons why source code also still has to adapt to be able to be re reproducible. But uh, we do, by default, provide an environment that is most conducive to creating reproducible builds. Um, when we say minimize on host dependencies for the build tool, that's important for us because we think going forward it's important to be able to always bootstrap a new hardware and get to a point where you can start building and you will have that same experience on a new platform. So, Reusable multipurpose build metadata is, as I said before, important to be able to target multiple outputs and multiple packaging formats with your same software, right? Um, right, so your developer cycles within BuildStream would be a little bit slower, so I say quick here, but scratch that. It's a little bit slower. <laughs> um, but at the same time, it means that every time you launch a shell or you run a test, you're running on exactly something that you know. And you're not necessarily only testing your application, you're testing your application with a modification that you might have done to GTK or to Qt, or a modification that you might have done even in glibc and then you can just run it, right? And always know this is exactly the combination of things I'm testing right now in this shell, which is quite interesting. Um, so artifact sharing is something that the belt developer benefits from. And if you have a work group, and somehow I'm getting a bit redundant here, sorry about that. 
artifact sharing is uh, people are appreciating it a lot right now in free desktop SDK because we're building things that take seven hours to build and when we share the artifacts then we only need to build like you know for 30 minutes and 20 minutes of it is downloading right because we only build what we want to test and what we want to change um, so I have enough time. I ran through that. Let's have a sh little look at what this looks like. So when you, this is a very small sample project. Um, it's Glade running on an import of a Debian basically image. So we, we're going to import a Debian image and then we're going to build Glade on top of that image using the tools that Debian provided. And then we're going to use Debian packaging tools to create a Debian package of Glade, all within a containerized environment, which if anybody were to run on their laptop, they should get exactly the same result, basically. So if you were on a Fedora system or an Ubuntu system or a SUSE system or any system that you could run BuildStream, you should be able to produce exactly the same Debian package for exactly the same Debian version, right? And one thing I'd like to just point out in the show output here is the cache keys. These are very interesting in BuildStream. They are basically hashes of all of the input. So every time you know, we, we see the hashes a lot in the user interface because they represent exactly the version or the, the, the hash of all of the inputs for a given output, basically. Right. So I'm just going to go over, OK, here. Um, I, I don't want to spend too much time talking because I don't have that much time. So basically, projects are composed of elements. Elements are all YAML files right now. Um, elements are related through dependencies. And elements can depend on elements in other projects. That, in, that allows for separation between projects and maintainerships of different builds. And uh, elements can all be implemented by plugins. So it's a very flexible system which just provides something for pipelining of builds in a sandbox environment, right? A pipeline is what we call a loaded collection of elements. So this is maybe one example of what a pipeline might look like if you were to visualize it. Import base system, build a lot of stuff, compose it into one file system, and generate an image with it, right? So those are all different kind of plugins that we have. We have an import element that's going to like just take an import of some data. And at the base of every pipeline, there's always an import. Um, build GNOME and so here for example we have basically the same kind of gnomish example here where we're going to build like epiphany or create a flat pack yeah so this is a uh, integrate for the SDK and integrate for the platform so this is this is basically how we create the gnome SDK but like in in a very condensed summary. <clears throat> to take a look at how the YAML files work. So here is basically what an import looks like. Um, seems the resolution is not very big. I'm not sure if anybody can read this. But basically, you have an import. You say, this is an import element by specifying the kind. And then you say this is the source, right? So you have element plugins and you have source plugins. And sources are just basically things which can interact with different revision control systems and tar and 
anything to get data in a reliable, hashable way, basically. Um, so then we have this. So since we imported Debian from a deep, from like a, what is it, multi, multi strap, right? So multi strap creates this thing that you can create a Debian image of like multiple architectures, right? But since we do it on an architecture that we don't know, we like that deboot strap process, we do it on an architecture that doesn't support running the binaries of all the different arches that we do. We postpone that step until the sandbox and we just run dpackage configure dash A, right? So this, this guy just basically takes the output of the previous element and says, okay, well, my install root is slash and I'm a script and I'm just gonna run this, transform my file system and the output is gonna be the slash and basically just runs deep package, configure everything. Some things fail, but mostly everything comes together and it works and we're happy. Yeah. <laughs> um, of course, if you were working, as we had been a year ago, if you were working with this deep package configure thing, you wouldn't do it that often, and usually it would be in a cache server and you would have downloaded the already configured for your architecture artifact, right? Um, so this is basically just the build, right? This, uh, yeah. So here we say, I depend on the configured deep package configure thing, and my sources are glade.git from GNOME, track the master branch. Um, basically, normally you would have the ref in there and that would be the git SHA of exactly which SHA that you're building. But for brevity, I kind of like snipped some things out. And here we have some public data which says the public data of an element can be read by its reverse dependencies. So this is just saying like, okay, I'm giving you some data and then the later element can read it. And the last element here is the dpackage deploy. And we've done this also with RPM in other projects. Um, I don't have a, a demo right now. A colleague of mine is having a demo, is creating a demo of m building Mozilla Firefox browser on to, for a snap and for a flat pack. I, I don't right now have a, a project which does multiple outputs. Um, this, one, this one basically just says my input is Glade and this dpackage deploy element that's a plugin that exists in BST external repository, uh, it just reads the public data of what it's packaging, right? So. There's not much configuration about how to build the package here because it's all already specified in the package where we declared the build. Mm. All right. So. It's a lot of material, I think, um, for a short time. The status of the build, we have stable releases since two years now. Um, we're not making any more stable releases because we're working on Buildstream 2. And that's a whole other deal. So we have a stable release 1.2 and we're adding bug fixes to it right now only. It's used by the GNOME release team to, to test and smoke test the build process of all of, the, all of the modules, see that they build together before every release. It's used to build the SDKs of Flatpak. So the GNOME release team is able to maintain the same build instructions for their GNOME release and for the SDKs, for the GNOME Flatpak SDK. Um, parenthesis, a flat pack SDK is like 
a firmware but without any systems and without a kernel that you use within a system called Flatpak, but I mean, Snap has something similar and that's basically a base that you can run things on. And we use it there. Uh, we use it for the base free desktop SDK as well. And right now I'm working on getting the GNOME nightly images so you should be able to have like a, an image of the latest GNOME and boot the latest GNOME at any time. And we should be doing nightlies of these with BuildStream and should be done in about a month, I guess. So we're working on 2.0. And since we've been doing a lot of work with Bloomberg and they care a lot about scale, we're working on scale and optimization. So I, I think the project is pretty fine. You can work on like a, a big project which is about 500 or 1,000 different things, you know, that you want to build, but like they're not happy if you don't, if you cannot build 50,000, you know, we, we want to load a pipeline and parse 50,000 YAML files and we want it to be snappy, right? And they're doing really interesting stuff. We're working together. Uh, okay, so also we're doing Windows and OS X ports, basically. Um, I don't think that we're gonna have native builds in Windows anytime soon, but we're gonna have the client working on Windows and we already have WSL tested. Um, right, distributed building, so that's should have been before. We're working with the Basil and Build Barn people. Um, we met up in London this year and we're working on using the same distributed build network. If, does anybody know what Basil is? No? Blaze? It's the Google build system? Any, anyway, it's, it's, it's a concept to speed up builds because they have huge amounts of software to build in a short time and they have very granular units. It means you have to rewrite your whole build system for your software to use Bazel. But if you do and you have a huge monolithic repository or a lot of gits that come together aggregated into one directory, it can be very interesting if you're willing to spend the effort, right? So we're working on integrating entire system builds with Google's Bazel to work on the same build network so that we can use the same caching resources and optimize full system huge builds with them and it's a lot of fun. I think it's a lot of fun. Um, if you haven't fell asleep yet, <laughs> then you can join us on IRC on the mailing list. Um, we have about three hack fests a year, and that's our last hack fest that we cannot see very well in London. Um, but as you can see, you, you can't really see anybody who's there, but you can see that there's a lot of people there, you know, and, and you should join us. <laughs> um, yeah, so any questions? Anybody want to know about build systems? Okay, um, I, I got a question there. Yes. So the question is, is why is it important to have a build you can reproduce? Why is it important to have a build you can reproduce? Yeah, a bit, ident a bit identical, like the SHA or the MD5 set. Okay, um, bit for bit? Yes. One of the main reasons bit for bit reproducibility is important is for validation. Because we don't know, we don't, if we don't know exactly what went into the output, right, and we don't, then we don't know how we made the output, right? And once we validated something, like it can take like five years for a car company to be really happy with their base system libraries. And if you say that we have to rebuild it again, but it's going to be different, but I only change one line of code, eh, eh, good, good luck. Good luck getting them to, to 
make that bug fix, right? Because we trust this binary worked for five years, right? Why change it? Okay. Yeah. So um, it's it's obviously uh, more important in, uh, for security and um, in um, telcos or uh, communication systems, of course. Mm. It's safety critical. Yeah. Any further questions? How hard is it to, uh, to say support for new languages in Buildstream? I mean, like I don't know, Node.js or other ecosystems with lots of packages. It's um, very easy. Um, basically, well, it's very easy for us in the Buildstream sense. We really only have some YAML defaults of what to do, right? So. The, the more difficult part is providing a base runtime which has the tooling that you need, right? So it's just a question of setting up a project that has the tooling that you need to execute and writing up a default YAML plugin that says, well, this is the default stuff and you can override, you know, configure options with such and such things. Yeah. All good. So that answers the question. Um, so, um, a round of applause, please. <laughs> <I don't deserve> <laughs>